the hero of, of Motherless Brooklyn is this character, Lionel Esrog, who's uh, an orphaned kid from Brooklyn, who's really kind of grown up on the mean streets of Brooklyn, and who is afflicted with Tourette's syndrome and obsessive compulsive disorder, and yet uh, is extremely bright, is very, has a very powerful mind, has a powerful memory, um, and a powerful ability to focus, you know, the, the, the positive side of his obsessive personality is that he, he holds information, as he says, like glass in the brain and, and um, is in a way to people, that he presents himself as a kind of a freak show, uh, which is what people call him, even his friends call him that, but he quietly is, is um, has real talents and skills that flow from his affliction. The story is essentially about an underdog outsider who is afflicted, a, a, a guy who's afflicted with Tourette's syndrome and obsessive compulsive disorder um, and who works for a New York private eye in the late 50s in New York. Um, and it's a murder mystery because it's about um, when his boss is killed uh, in, a, in, a, in a dark and sort of mysterious meeting, um, this character, Lionel, has to sort of set off to try to figure out who killed his only friend and why. And in the course of doing it, he, he uncovers a, a, a very grand corruption. This is a very unorthodox thing to propose to an author of a novel but thankfully, Jonathan Lethem's like, he's, he's as, as passionate a student of New York as I am. And he really, I think, I couldn't have been luckier in the sense that he authentically loved the idea of the hero that he had created being serialized into another story, almost like Mickey Spillane, you know, like Mike Hammer or Sam Spade or any of these detectives that people wrote lots of stories about. And that's kind of how we talked about it. It's like, like, let's take Lionel and send him off into his next detective adventure. Um, but, um, so it was a strange thing to do because it meant I was graft, I was taking Jonathan's character and some of the ideas that drove the book and, and transplanting them into an original story that was totally of my own making. Directing a movie is almost, by definition, antagonistic to the state of mind you want to be in as an actor. It just is. Um, you, you want to be out of your head when you're acting and you got to have your head on top of everything when you're directing. So you're doing something that, that's antagonistic to, to what I associate with the best work, acting. And that means, A, you got to really own that character long before you ever step into doing it. And it also means that if you're going to have any hope of focusing as an actor, your preparation as a director has got to be just like we used to the whole time we were doing this, we would say like the dirty dozen, you know, Donald Duck goes here. And that, you, know, you have to have it like, you gotta have a game plan that is just moves like a machine where, where your collaborators don't need answers from you on the day as much as possible. Like where everybody knows when we show up, this is what we're doing. We've thought it through, we've asked the questions, we all know what to do and now we gotta execute. And that way you can carve a little bit of space for yourself you know, to be an actor. When I sent it to him, Alec, he, he wrote me, when he was in the middle of reading it, he said, like, I feel my inner Lee J. Cobb coming out, which is a very, like, inside baseball actor's reference, but Lee J. Cobb, you know, if you watch, like, On the Waterfront, John, he's Johnny Friendly in On the Waterfront, 12 Angry Men. When he said that, I just went, oh my God, like, if he, if he gets in, if that's where he locates this, if he gets into that gear, He's, he's gonna be an animal in this, and, that, and he was. Like, I, I think, um, you know, there's a, there's a monologue, he has a monologue in the film toward the end that I, I sort of assumed no one would be able to get through. I assumed I'd have to cut it down. And he, he came to it like, like, a Shakes, like a great Shakespearean actor. He, he drove through it, he makes such sense of it. It's so fantastic. Like, um, I, 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 I don't like watching things I've done over and over again. I will never get tired of watching him do this monologue in the end. 
when I was talking about like people who are just stone cold pros, like Goo Goo, Goo is that very best thing. Um, I mean, she's like a true thoroughbred. She can just turn on a dime. She she is so facile and so gifted. She makes it extremely easy for someone like me who's wearing too many hats and having, in some cases, uncomfortably feeling the need to pivot in a given moment. If you have, if you're working with an actress, especially in the kind of intimate scenes that we had to do, who's thrown by the, their scene partner in these intimate scenes sort of breaking out and also being their director, you're toast. I mean, you're just absolute toast. And she, she was like my MVP. To me, Willem's just gotten like even more and more and more interesting and, um, and compelling as an actor. And I've been lucky to get to know him through working on the movies with Wes. Um, and I thought like the character he plays is really the moral center of the movie. He's, he's, he seems like a crank in the beginning and the, the further it goes, you, you realize he's actually Obi-Wan Kenobi. He's, he, he's the man in rags in the desert who is actually a Jedi Knight. And, and actually is like the most moral person in the film. Um, and to me, he, he has that, he has the ability to straddle that thing where you might think he's a, a, a schizophrenic or a homeless person or whatever. And, and in truth, he's, you know, he's kind of like the one. And so you, it's like, to me, like the guy who played like Bobby Peru <laughs> and Jesus is kind of perfect for that. Um, <laughs> and so, so again, I was just like super lucky. If you came up in New York theater in my era, like Cherry Jones, it's like, you know, she's w one of the, the bright lights on Broadway. I mean, really like the heiress and so doubt so many, I mean, you can't even really name all the great like theater performances Cherry's given. And um, her character is sort of, I call her like the hardcore old unrepentant Bronx socialist. You know what I mean? And I think that she's tough, no, tough as nails, and she just has all that. Like if you know, if you saw Cherry in the Shanley play, uh, Doubt, it's like as the the hard ass nun. It's like I'll take that. Like just that. You don't even have to do anything different. Just like let's put you in, let's take you out of the nun's outfit, put you in like a, put you in like a, um, you know, a crusading reformer's um, tweed dress, and it'll be great. And it is, like, she's great. I worked with Dick Pope on The Illusionist um, back in, like, 2005. And um, he was already, he was in my, he was in my pantheon of the greatest living cinematographers at that time because of Vera Drake, um, um, Topsy Turvy, all the, all the films with Mike Lee, which ranged from, like, the grittiest, you know, um, like Naked and those Im improvisational films that he made with Mike to the most lush, lustrous and luscious uh, period films like Topsy Turvy and um, everything he did, I would look at it and just go, what is, what is that guy doing? You know, I, I, um, I loved it. And when we worked on The Illusionist, I, I was just like blown away by him. We recreated the old Penn Station um, and I'm really proud of what we pulled off. Beth, our incredible visual effects supervisor, Mark Russell. Um, we, I've had many people asking me, did you, where did, did you guys find that in Budapest? Did you find it in things? And they don't know that we, we recreated Penn Station in a gigantic hangar out on Long Island. And I think lots of very, Jim Cameron wasn't really even able to parse when I showed it to him how much was built and how much was in the effects world and stuff like that because um you know we took this just one of the great destroyed architectural masterpieces of america and brought it back to life and i'm i'm pretty proud of that we knew we wanted laura and lionel to dance in this club and we had we were kind of like well what song of that era would be right and then just kind of on an off notion i i said to winton like well what if you did a, a sort of a, a late 50s Miles Davis ballad style arrangement of Tom's song? And he did that and I played it for Tom and Tom just like almost lost it. He was like, that's 
just the best thing I've ever heard. And so, so what's, what's really beautiful about Tom's song is it's in the film, sort of voiced by him. And we went through this thing of like, should we, should we have it sung by someone else? And ultimately I just thought that Tom's voice is so, um, I felt it was the perfect like voice for Lionel in a way. And then it returns sort of in the tissue of the period in its jazz incarnation, and and I I uh, I love it. I think it's um it was funny when Winton heard it, he I, he kind of listened to it and he like took the headphones off and he was like, "That's a straight up standard." When we got into um, writing the score with Daniel Pemberton, who is himself kind of a, a protean genius. We started just realizing like we were going to write this very classical jazz score, this like with real melodies and real um, set pieces. And Daniel said, well, Jesus, like I can't get, I know we can't get Winton to play the trumpet for the whole score. And I was like, well, why don't we ask him? And so it grew and evolved and ultimately Winton, Winton played all of the trumpet solo um, through the whole orchestral score, the whole jazz orchestra score. And I mean, that's just like, you know, that's you, like having like Ted Williams come in and and pinch hit for you. It's like it's like he he brought such a, a incredible he, his tone on the instrument is so beautiful and um, it 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 is literally the musical stand-in for Lionel's inner life and uh, it gets now I watch it it gets me every time because it's it's so melancholy there it has such. A lonely, melancholy tone, and I think um, I think Daniel Pemberton wrote some like incredibly memorable themes, and but getting Winton on them was was just uh, just the most incredible blessing. In that era, you had some of the most exciting, you know, hard bop, like giving way to what Miles Davis was doing in these in, with Birth of the Cool and um, modal jazz a little bit after that and and all of that that like to me if there's a if there is a musical expression of the improvisational wild delightful quality that can come out through Tourette's it's jazz and especially you know kind of hard bop so I loved the idea of Lionel finding his way into that world and realize and being set off by the music because in a way the music is the music is is like him and and seeing him get sort of liberated by the music um, so in a way that he isn't forced to suppress uh, what's what's often trying to come out of him. I was always fascinated by um, specifically some of the things that that happened in New York in the 50s in particular but you know we there's, there's so many, you know, you, you hear about the famous names in New York, LaGuardia, Al Smith, the great Tammany governor of New York, LaGuardia, the famous mayor, Nelson Rockefeller, like, and there's kind of the history of the, the known people who were the leaders, but there's this incredible secret history to New York as well, who the power bosses were, who were the real, the real people who pulled the strings, you know, who were the Darth Vaders behind it all. And when and the more you learn about New York and you learn about sort of like how the sausage really got made, in a way, you you just realize um, that most New Yorkers and most Americans in a lot of ways we we float on kind of this one narrative about how things got to be the way they are. And when you find these things out, you realize like how the old city got converted into the modern city is a really deep and dark story. And um, and I, and I felt that what Lionel and Motherless Brooklyn represented was this great, it was this great vehicle for going into these things that I wanted to go into. You know, people don't get to shoot in the main reading room of the New York Public Library. We found this, this yeah, this pool in Harlem that people, everybody has said to us, where, where the hell is that? And um, there's some of these really featured places. Um, but I, I like, you know, to me, New York has these experiences when you live there of, of um, places that imprint, you know, and, and we 
we shot uh, we shot our own neighborhood. Me and Willem and Bill and my producer, we we all live in the village, and you know we used we used the village um, in some ways that are were really fun for us because we lit parts of our part of the town that that um, are very notable, like Washington Square Park. But we also, you know, we did shots of Alec Baldwin and Willem Dafoe confronting each other under an awning that are based on certain photographs that I loved where there's dark, and we figured out how to shut all the lights off on Fifth Avenue and um, make a deep pool of darkness to create certain effects of light that I think um, we're all pretty proud of. You can't really be interested in New York and not encounter Robert Moses um, down whatever vector you, you look. So yes, like, and obviously a lot of the macro history is the history of what happened, like, um, uh, that was driven by him. But there's, al there's also a large dimension of the deeper secrets in the film and what it's really about on a psychosexual level, on a, um, in term without giving too much away, that is, um, that is very specifically, in my mind, drawn from other figures um, that I think were personified kind of what I would call the, the, you know, the gross hypocrisies of racism. It's a really, 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 really well-produced film. And I think this group was, it was definitely like a, a one plus one plus one equals way more than four kind of, you know, my partners in it were all had really fantastic um, experience sets. To get a group together that, again, was really like just stone cold professionals who really each individually like do the work of double or triple. This was just a, a production with a scale of complexity that was not gonna get pulled off um, without a group that could chop up the very, very, very heavy demands of it and 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 pull it off um so i feel like we were like you know the justice league um it was the justice league of producers people go to the same friggin costume warehouses they just do like it's why you see stuff and it looks the same and amy has access um in ways we, we will not disclose like but she has access to stuff that's not available because she comes from this lineage of great costume designers, like, and she, she, we got, we got, we got the private warehouse, um, and you can, you can tell, I think, when you look at the film, it's really, it's really beautiful. But she, and and she has a great sense of character. Like I think Mike Lionel kind of goes from being one way. He kind of evolves, and she really worked with me on like, as he steps more and more into his boss's shoes. How does he literally start to like? What, how, do, how do we track across the film the degree to which he's literally stepping into the coat of, of his mentor? And I think it's really neat, it's subtle, but by the end, you sort of realize that he has become his mentor and, it, and it, it's even expressed in the clothes, which I loved. Paul Shu, you know, I was, I really, uh, I gave him a very specific mandate that I think he got very excited about and I which was that in combo with the music I wanted I wanted the soundscape of the film to have a very modern edge where you have a period sensibility but you have something cutting through it um, a modernism cutting through it that sort of makes it more emotionally visceral and I really wanted to create because of Lionel's brain and the inner and our and our intention to depict at times, cinematically depict the way his brain works. I knew I wanted to have like soundscapes and, tr and, and tropes that were not naturalistic. That's fun, that's like a lot of trial and error, but sometimes what I love about someone like Paul is our reference points were very similar. You're able to communicate about films you love, you're able to draw on certain references and then he goes out and God knows where it, they find or create a lot of the source of what they find, but um, it was wonderful. Mark Russell, I had never worked with. He, like, he he was one of the best visual effects. His taste, his sense of how to get what I was going for, 
phenomenal. Um, and Joe Klotz is like, you know, he's he's Academy Award nominated, New York based, Brooklyn based editor, and he's just a great guy. Editing, in addition to the chops, you really just want someone that you can stand to be in a room with <laughs> for that much time. And Joe is such a gentleman and, um, and patient, uh, you know, great work ethic. I mean, that's, y your editor really needs to be your steady hand, like, like a person who's just like willing to execute um, uh, fast on any idea and then bring around a point of view like when you're ready for it, you know, and, and I, I really, I can't say enough good about Joe um, or Mark.